open. Lem. Lem, it's Larry us. Larry there. Can you can you let us in? Buddy? Buddy? I, I think I think it's working. I think it's working. Hello, everyone! Hey. Welcome to the Sword and Laser <laughs> Season 2. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. It's so good to be back at the Space Castle. Thank you for making it possible. Yes, all of your donations and our Kickstarter made this possible, and we are deeply indebted to all of you. It's a little dusty in here, but yeah. I think... Yeah, Len's been keeping it in operating I think we though, can so make it work. Be working. Absolutely. Hopefully. Well, this is our series of author spotlights, where we descend into the works of an author, prowl about the meaning and impact of it all, and then get, you know, forced outside into a post-apocalyptic world uh, with nothing but a Brillo pad. I mean, actually, we, we interview we, the authors. Interview yeah. Them. yeah, let's let's actually start out by telling you the eight things that, according to our sheriff, Lem, you are allowed to know about Hugh Howey. Hugh Howey was raised in Monroe, North Carolina, and attended college in Charleston, South Carolina, and currently lives in Jupiter, Florida. He literally likes to take long walks on the beach, or maybe literarily likes it. Yeah, no. No. He studied physics and English at the College of Charleston, but dropped out his junior year to sail to the Bahamas. Howey has worked as a yacht captain, a roofer, and a bookseller. Howie's first novel, Molly Fide and the Parsona Rescue, was published on August 22, 2009. The best-selling Wool was self-published as a standalone short story on Amazon that grew into a serial novel in 2011. Wool was the most favorably reviewed book on Amazon in 2012, with an average rating of 4.8 out of 5 stars. In October 2012, Amazon dropped the price of the Wool Omnibus from $5.99 to $1.99, and 20,000 copies sold in a single day. Howie is famous for signing a print-only contract with publishers, keeping electronic rights to his books. He has said, I found success because I wrote for the love of writing. I self-published simply because I wanted to own my work. At a convention once, Howie introduced himself to George R. R. Martin, saying Wool was number six on Amazon's sci-fi chart behind Martin's five books. Martin signed a book for Mr. Howie, inscribing it to number six. Keep trying. Howie has said, if you're going to procrastinate, do something useful like an interview. We'll be happy to help with that shortly. Dust, the third in the Silo Saga, came out August 17th, 2013. The novel Sand is currently being serialized. Well, the graphic novel comes out February 11th, 2014, and Ridley Scott and Steve Zalian are working on the adaptation of Wool into a movie. Perhaps we've said too much. Ah, what the hey, we can't stop the signal. Aaron, what more about Hugh Howey should we know? Charles Dickens was the master of the cliffhanger. Much of his work was published in serial installments, forcing readers to wait with bated breath for the next chapters to be published so they could find out what happened. The technique was so successful that when rumors went around New York that the final chapters of the old curiosity shop were aboard an incoming vessel, crowds stormed the wharf district. Riots broke out. Given the history of serial publication, it's maybe a surprise the style's been out of vogue for so long. Enter the internet, the venue which makes anyone who wants to be their own publisher, and nobody has taken better of advantage of it than Hugh Howey. And he's not shy about sharing the wealth, either. Howey appears primed to lead a wave of self-publishing from fanfic sites to the bestseller lists, and he is generous with advice about how to do it. I have mentioned before how Howey's willingness to send his post-apocalyptic narrative through alternating cycles of hope and despair can leave me feeling both thrilled and disoriented. It turns out that he is willing to bring about the same sense of Ragnarok to publishing as a whole. All in all, he's fulfilling the proverbial Chinese curse, not just for sci-fi, but for the entire industry. If Howie has anything to say about it, these will be interesting times. Interesting times indeed. Yes, and I love the Ken Burns effect that Aaron's added to the whiteboard videos. Oh, yeah. Very He's slick. Well done himself. Mm -hmm, I didn't think that was impossible. All right, enough talking about Hugh Howey behind his back. He sold 500 million books just waiting for us. Yes, and uh, <laughs> he may send us out for a cleaning if we make him wait any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, Hugh Howey is here. Hugh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for having me. So now, we read Wool Omnibus, um, of course, for the book club. Can you explain first what Wool is about and how it came to be for those who didn't read along with us? Yeah, it's, um, it's a story about uh, the last of humanity living in an underground silo, and this character who lives at the very bottom of the silo, Juliet, this mechanic, um, is promoted to sheriff and starts to unravel uh, why her people are there, how they got there, who's in charge. It's... Uh, so it's like a, a mystery and a thriller and a dystopian end of the world saga all in one. And it had a, had a really interesting um, uh, origin. It's, it's actually 
more common than not in science fiction. Uh, it started as a short story, and the demand and the uh, popularity of that short story um, resulted in me writing the rest of the novel. Did you know where it was going when you wrote the short story, or was it more of a, of a like, oh crap, people really like this, I need to come up with something else? <laughs> it was more of the latter. I, I wrote the, it was a self-contained story. I was, there was not going to be anything afterward. And um, for people who've read that first story, they, they can see the challenges uh, inherent in um, picking up where I left off. But uh, it was the first time I'd had people um, not only read uh, in droves something I had read, but people get in touch and say, we want more of this. So when I started the second one, I did map out the rest of the series because I, I didn't um, you know, want to meander. I, I had to come up with uh, a much larger plot, and that was a big challenge, but uh, it was part of the fun of, uh, of writing this and interacting with readers while I was writing the, uh, the books. Now, of course, we mentioned uh, that we read this for the book club, and our readers really, really enjoyed it. Um, so we have a ton of listener questions. And uh, first up was from Ben. He wants to know, how do you stay disciplined in your writing process when something takes off in the way that Wool did and the other silo books have? Uh, does it have to evolve to reflect or, or accommodate the hugely increased attention uh, and demand for your writing? Uh, my approach has been to uh, continue to write as if only my mom and my wife will read anything that I write. Um, I, and I, I keep this in mind while I'm writing. Once I'm done and get ready to publish, I assume that millions of people will see what, I'm, I'm, um, what I've written. Uh, that gives me the freedom to write loose and fast the way I always have and to um, stick to the books that I want to see. But uh, before I put the book out there, I want to make sure that it's perfect you know, before, uh, before a whole bunch of eyeballs get on it. Um, the, the, the challenge uh, with time constraints, um, it's kind of a wash. Before uh, I was able to write for a living, I had a day job, and I had to write around that. And basically what I've done is replaced that day job with uh, a day job of traveling for publishers and doing book tours and doing interviews, responding to emails, um, the film and comic book stuff. So um, the challenges are the same. It's just... Uh, Everything I'm doing now is, is writing related rather than uh, going into the bookstore and shelving other people's books and dusting shelves all day, which I loved, but um, you know, hang, hanging out with uh, um, film production companies and stuff like that is even more fun. <laughs> yeah, ma making the books sometimes <laughs> more, more fun than shelving the books, right? Yeah, it is. I enjoy all, all aspects of publishing, so it's, uh, this is just a dream for me. Uh, Andrew has a question that I actually had when I was reading Wool as well. He wants to know if you were inspired by Philip K. Dick's The Penultimate Truth at all. No, other people have brought that up, and I'm, I'm a Dick fan, but I haven't read that. Um, but uh, I, I definitely need to. It's funny how many um, similarities people have found in, in other works, some of which uh, I'd never heard of in, until after I wrote Wool. I, I didn't know people were really building bunkers out of um, missile silos until after I wrote this. I thought I was making this up. Meanwhile, people are really doing it. Um, I, what, I, what I think happens with a lot of these parallels is, um, uh, first of all, there's a lot of entertainment being made, but um, uh, we, we, send, we tend to re revolve around the same stories and the same um, you know, ideas that we want to explore. So um, I, I think that's why we have a lot of parallels in, in literature and film and TV and everywhere. Weirdly, and I just this just kind of popped into my head, have you heard from any people who are actually planning to do something like live in a silo during the apocalypse? <laughs> I've heard from people who own some of the silos, uh, the, the Atlas silos that have been purchased, and uh, one guy has offered to um, have like a big uh, wool like sleep-in book convention in, in, in a silo, yeah. I want to uh, go to that! Uh, I'm dying to go to it. Uh, we've, I've got to figure out if we can make that happen and, and when we would schedule that and like which of us uh, five crazy people would actually show up for it with our sleeping bags. But um, I, I would love to see it. His is pretty famous. He's uh, been in, uh, on TV and in newspapers giving tours of, of his silo. And um, he's got one of the launch doors functional. And uh, yeah, I would, I would love to do that. You know, even cooler, there's that place in Las Vegas, that, like, mansion that's underground. Did you hear about that? No. There's this massive mansion underground in Las Vegas, and it's built as a bomb shelter. And it's basically like a 60s-style home that's been underground for the past, you know, 50 years. And it looks really old school, but it's completely functional. And it has its own air ventilation system and, and food storage places and a pool. So, you know, it's kind of like living in the lap of luxury in the post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> Do they send people out for cleanings? They're trying to sell it. 
No, they, they don't yet, but yeah. they, they are. Someone can actually buy it. So hey, you know, just just putting that idea out there for Sell you. Sell a few more books, maybe you can pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like a five million dollar home or something. It's kind of crazy. Uh, but bringing it back to the viewer questions, um, we have a question from Jason. He wants to know why do you choose to publish your stories in parts in all of the various media um, instead of waiting for a full novel, uh, which we all know is eventually coming. Uh, we have seen this with Wool Omnibus, with Shift Omnibus, Asylum Number Two, and now Sand Omnibus as well. Yeah, I and I recommend to the people who want to read it all at once just to, to wait for the novel. Um, part of it is, you know, I release them very quickly, so a week or two weeks apart. And what I found with Wool, there were a lot of people who enjoyed the downtime in between to process each individual part. Uh, I try to write these, um, well, some of my books like uh, a season of television where each episode tells uh, one story, but then there's an overall plot arc across the entire novel. And uh, I, I get a lot of readers who read my books in a single sitting, even though some of them are three and five hundred pages, and I, uh, part of um, the, the pleasure of writing is we can control when um, readers take a pause by putting in a chapter break, so they have to digest what what they just read and then take the turn time to turn a page, and with my Q and A in wool at the end, I wanted you know I, I extended that pause before the epilogue to make people really have another gap, but with the serialization, you know, people have a week to digest and to discuss things online, and, and some people prefer that. So I offer both as an option. As soon as the last one's out, I, I, I offer the full novel, and I tell people if that's how you prefer, wait. Uh, the cost is about the same. I make less money on the serialized hmm. editions, but um, it's, it's something I learned organically through the way uh, Wool just happened to come out. And um, yeah, people were enjoying reading a, a, a single episode that they could polish off in 30 minutes or, or an hour and a half at a time. Yeah, it's like water cooler talk for, for television shows. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of along those lines, Mel has a question about how some authors will put out a short story, say, and then they'll rework that short story into a longer novel and, and wants to know, do you ever wish you had done that or think about doing that instead of like with Wool, where you had to kind of pick up after the short story. Yeah, uh, you know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite books was Ender's Game, which started off as a short story, and uh, Fahrenheit 451 uh, started off the same way. And they did the other route, where they took that idea like a like a seed, and then they rewrote an entire novel around it. Um, I've thought about that with some of my other short stories, but uh, it would have been a different book. I think what works really well for Wool is some of the changes and in, in points of view and. The, uh, the the style and the tone of, of each part is allowed to breathe a little more freely by being self-contained, and um, and frankly, uh, I don't know. It was taking direction from uh, the audience and saying, okay, we want to know what happens right after this. And uh, I, I've likened it to the difference between recording an album in a studio and playing a set on a stage. There's um, hmm. this energy between the audience and the performer. Uh, and you see this on Broadway and live plays as well, where the performer can feed off the energy of the audience. And it's hard to do that in literature, but, but this is one way to approximate it, and I love it. it. It makes me, you know, when I was writing Wool, I was getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to, to really pour on the words, and, and um, I was daydreaming about the story just all day long, and a lot of that was because of the feedback I was getting from readers. That's so interesting. And, and how much do you think that the uh, feedback that you got actually informed the writing further down the line? It, it definitely informed it. Um, it uh, the, the trick is to know what your reader uh, expects and what they know at any one time in, in, as they're reading. Because uh, it's like writing a murder mystery. You don't know if you're making the clues too obvious or if you're making it um, too obscure. Mm. And writers get that feedback now. They get it from their spouse. They get it from their agent. They get it from their editor. Um, I that feedback is crucial, but all those people are guessing what the readers are gonna say, so why not go directly to them? And, and we see this in other forms of entertainment where our, our market research, we go straight to the source if we can. Um, so a lot of the times, the uh, I would use their expectations to defy them and realize, um, okay, if they really like this character, then uh, that doesn't mean we necessarily give them more of it. It might mean that um, you take a break from them to highlight someone else. It, so it's not a paint by number thing where you, um, you're getting feedback, oh, you mean to write that? I want to write that next. You're getting feedback, oh, this is your emotional response to this story. Um, I wonder you know, what you're going to think when I do this 
to these characters. Yeah, you could just go the George R. R. Martin route and be like, oh, you like this character? <laughs> dead. Sorry, dead. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but dead that's now. kind of, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like them too much. It's, well, it's similar to Mongolia. The Mon they intentionally mm. created the Mongolia website to kind of foster that sort of thing. So, Interesting, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jason comes back with another question. Um, what what kind of draws you to the post-apocalyptic genre? Well, you know, it's funny. With uh, with Wool, I didn't think of it as a post-apocalyptic story, really, because it, it doesn't take um, place on a wasteland so much as in a pretty functioning society. To me, it's more of a dystopia. It's uh, um, it's more of a story about totalitarian governments. Uh, it's, and it was written in the um, while the Arab Spring was going on and while Occupy Wall Street was going on. If you have any of the old self-published print editions, all my page 99 say 99 percent. and I hide like little things in there nice. to pay homage to, um, to what uh, I was reading in current events while I was writing. Um, I do write some post-apocalyptic stuff, but uh, like with Sand, it's again, it's more uh, writing about dystopia. This time, it's the opposite of totalitarianism. I'm writing about uh, lawless states. Um, but I think the allure of post-apocalyptic work, uh, and I'm doing an anthology right now with uh, John Joseph Adams, um, is stories uh, are driven by tension, and that in, in a contemporary literary novel that can that can be emotional tension, but for physical drama it's hard to get more tense than the end of the world. You know that's Battlestar Galactica, the the reboot, was um, one of the most intense things I've ever watched on TV because anybody makes a mistake and all of humanity is extinct, and that um, uh, I. I what could, what, how, the, how could the stakes be any higher than that? It's just, um, it, it really keeps you up late at night turning the page because mm -hmm. um, it, it's not just like, well, my, maybe something bad will happen to these characters. It's something could ha bad could happen to all of creation. Trike really loves the cover illustrations to the Wool series. Uh, and he says, once I read the stories, I realized how clever they were. Who did those? I'm not sure which ones because they've been reissued so many times. Um, is it? He's uh, saying the original ones, I think. Oh, the, oh, the very first ones? Yeah. Those are mine. I, are I, they really? I've never had anybody compliment those before. <laughs> yeah, you mean so like the the one with the with the thread with the wool cut out of it and um, the numbers upside down on the suit. I don't know. I, I had my own editions and then I heard from um, uh, a graphic designer that like uh, you should update those and he offered me some art. So oh, nice. Yeah, that's always good. Well, it's like okay, I, I guess you're right, but. Thanks for, thanks for making it free, too, so that's good. Who was the, who was the graphic designer? I formed a relationship with them. So I've, uh, Mike Tabor was the first person to reach out to me like that, and now he does um, uh, book uh, jackets for uh, self-published authors. Oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah, and, and the guy I used for my editor sent me an email one day saying um, that the subject line was 161 things wrong with wool. And uh, it, it was hilarious. It was like every mistake in the omnibus. And I emailed him back, and I was like, you're hired. And... <laughs> And now he's almost a, a full-time uh, freelance editor. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to accept help. You know, obviously need it. My wife's a psychologist, so I'm, you can see that I'm <laughs> not above uh, <laughs> enlisting help. Asking for help. That's a good thing. It's very yeah. positive. Um, Nancy wants to know, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Wool movie deal? Can you tell us anything about it? I'm quite curious to see if the screenwriter will attempt to handle the novella format uh, or just get right to Juliet's story. Um, yeah, the so... Ridley Scott and Steve Zalian picked up the option uh, a little over a year ago, and um, you know I, I assume that would be the last I ever heard of this. But uh, it's been moving forward. They've uh, hired a, a screenwriter, and he's uh, finished the script. And uh, 20th Century Fox is on board, so I think this year would be the year that we started um, doing casting. I'm still not going to believe it until I'm sitting in the seat, you know, with the, my mm -hmm. ticket ripped in half. But um, the the challenge. Uh, I think is to cut down the first two novellas um, and, and run through that pretty quickly to get to Juliet. But I, I think you can tell both of those stories uh, in short order. I, I, you know, I don't think it'll be a challenge to turn this into a two-hour film. Um, so uh, the graphic novel is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Anybody who picks up that, I think it starts coming out in uh, uh, next month or in March. Um, they can see the way the storyline will, will follow uh, in the film because we had the same constraints with the six issue uh, comic to graphic novel uh, that we'll have with the film. Now, do you have any pie in the sky casting ideas for the film? Oh, yeah, if we want to get uh, really crazy, well, my, my preference would be um, you know unknown people because as a viewer, I am distracted when Brad Pitt walks on the screen pretending to be 
you know, uh, a military commander, I'm like, no, that's Brad Pitt. You know, it takes a <laughs> while for, for my brain to uh, acclimate. Uh, and also like the idea of giving people uh, a new shot. But um, yeah, I think it'd be cool to, to have Sigourney Weaver play, uh, and this is, you're talking pie in the sky, this will never happen, but have Sigourney Weaver play uh, the mayor and have uh, Harrison Ford play the sheriff <gasps> so that Ridley Scott gets uh, Blade Runner and uh, Alien in there as that, that, that romance. Oh, not as the sheriff, as the deputy, so that, that oh, old okay. couple yeah, yeah. that has that romance. Um, so yeah, it can never happen, but and they're they're not on screen for long, so it, it it could be done. I just think it'd be too cute to actually pull it off. But hey, never say never. I think that'd be awesome. I think it's just cute enough. <laughs> I want to see or, that too. Or um, uh, for solo, you could really have fun. I think Robin Williams would be a great solo. Oh wow, yeah. That's yeah, he cool. could he could he could bring the crazy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> just yeah. be yourself, Robin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let him go. Don't even give him a script. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Sarah wants to know any hints on what's next. Are you currently working on anything? I mean, I'm sure you're working on anything, but anything you can talk to people about? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on this anthology with John Joseph Adams. It's uh, the Apocalypse Triptych. Um, and uh, I cannot believe the lineup of writers we have for this. And I'm, I've only got a few of the stories left, but the, what I've read so far, uh, I, I think this is going to be maybe one of the strongest anthologies uh, in, in many years. It's just every story seems like it could win an award. And the, the cool thing about this trilogy is the first book is about the pre-apocalypse. Mm -hmm. The second book takes place during an apocalypse, and that can mean anything. And then the last of the book, um, of the three books, is the post-apocalypse. And some of these authors are writing a story across all three. And oh, wow. so a little bit of that 2000 AD comic, you know, where you... You, you pick up each book to carry on with different stories, and some stories are picking up in the second book, and some are falling off, you know. And um, but the, the strength of the writing is incredible. And working with John Joseph Adams, who's one of the best uh, editors in the business, he's like the anthology king. I mean, he he's, he's done so many. We were really excited about that, uh, the apocalyptic and uh, uh, trilogy when we when we heard about it on the podcast. And I actually did the help fund my robot army anthology with him oh, yeah. as well. I did a short story for that. So oh, you did? Yeah, cool. yeah. So I'm I'm very familiar with his work at this point. But he's done so many great anthology collections. It's like it's really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. And we've got Paula. Uh, Pachacalupi in this, so we've got uh, Jamie Ford, who's never written. John, he did uh, Hotel on the Corner, Bitter and Sweet. He's a literary author, and his story moved me to tears. Um, we've got uh, Ken Liu. We, um, it, it's an incredible lineup of authors, um, and uh, I'm, I'm almost gonna have to convince uh, John to pull my story out of there because I'm getting a little embarrassed about. Oh come on! I doubt that. I doubt that. <laughs> it's a uh, it's, it's hard to nice. read, read some of these guys and compare yourself to them, but I got really excited about this uh, sure. anthology. Well, you're being very humble, uh, but we know that you have a lot of fans out there. And uh, Fiona wants to know, I know from experience that you answer your fan mail, how much time does that take every day? I spend uh, a little over an hour um, with my email that's non-business related, but just uh, doing, responding to fans and answering questions. Um, but I, it's not work for me. That's, you know, that's when I'm done with my day and I'm done with my writing and do my business stuff and I can sit back and it's like sitting in a cafe and having a conversation with your with your readers so um, it's one of the one of my favorite parts of my day I have to say that when uh, we were booking for for this show you had the fastest response of any <laughs> author and I really really appreciated that like that made oh, I was just like oh, he wrote back yay I'm so it's busy that my list. attitude is I have to do everything immediately you know you can't, yeah I can't, yeah I, I don't have time to make a list basically. you got you got back to her faster than she gets back to me i don't respond to tom <laughs> yeah. most days i, I didn't respond like, to tom either so nah, no nobody does. nobody does i'm not even here <laughs> uh but you will respond to alexander who has the next question i'm sure i hope he wants to know what is your or maybe she what is your number one editing tip it's a good question um well in the revision stage with editing i would say to read out loud there's so many it's hard to read. It's hard to edit your own work, and it's hard to find your typos and to see your mistakes. And what's funny is when you're when you're reading really quickly, your brain will take out an extra that or an extra the if it's there, and it'll plug in missing words because it, it knows what it expects. So if you if you read the work out loud, or if you feed it to a text to speech program, your your voice, your ear will skip and and hear what the mistake that you made. It's very laborious to do this, which is why most people don't. But uh, I find that. Not only does it help me catch mistakes, but I hear the rhythm of the sentences better, and I can tell if uh, if it needs to be tweaked. 
And our final viewer question comes from longtime listener Gord, who wants to know what is your favorite unexpected bonus or discovery from opening up your world and encouraging others to write in it? Well, the coolest thing for me is seeing um, uh, other artists get uh, get a kind of a boost. I know what it's like to be. I think this is why you see authors being so generous to other aspiring writers to read their uh, early works and to write blurbs and things like that. Um, we know what it's like to try to break in and how challenging it is. Some of these um, fan fiction authors who are full-time or you know dedicated writers in their in their own right, um, uh, they've been able to take their writing in my world and bring readers over to their material, and uh, that's exciting for me because uh, I never thought I would be in this position where I was writing full-time, but to be in a position where I'm helping other people. Um, uh, develop a readership and improve their um, career uh, trajectory. That's it's a huge honor, and uh, I, I didn't expect any of this. So that's it's been one of the coolest things about um, about having the success and, and opening the world up to exploration. I love that, and I, and I love that that's kind of the the internet culture that has been mm -hmm. fostered. Uh, so it makes me happy to hear that. We're gonna finish up with a couple of questions. These are questions we're sort of circulating around to different authors in this season of the video show at Sword and Laser. We call them the super questions. Oh no. Uh, the first one is, what's your favorite deadline extension excuse to an editor? I, I've never done that before. I've always, uh, I guess I would say, um, uh, I don't know, I would, I would try something uh, really corny like uh, my dog ate it, but I've, I've never had to do it. I'm, have you had anybody do it to you in any of like, the anthologies or anything? Yeah, we've we've had people have to extend their deadline, um, but you know they don't give an excuse. They just say, I need to <laughs> these, these are these are such big name people that we're like, we're on the You're like, that's fine. We're like, that's whatever okay. you need, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. My dog ate my laptop. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very good that's excuse. That's fine, Mr. Martin, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> don't kill me. <laughs> don't, please don't kill me. And finally, uh, if you could ban a word, what would it be? Uh, swivel. Swivel? Yeah. But don't what am it. I doing right now? You're swiveling. Oh. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> why, why swivel? I don't know. It's just the first word that came to mind. That yeah. I, it's, That's it's just a, a funny one, sounding word. That's a hard yeah. one because there's not a really good replacement for it. I guess you could say twist. Twist, spin. No. Spin. The spin, the spin infers that you go all the way around. I think it's such a cute word, it's distracting. How could you use it without it becoming the focus of the sentence? Mm -hmm. You can see that. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. It's a, it's a look at me word. Exactly. Look at me swiveling. It's so look fancy. Look at me swiveling. <laughs> <laughs> it's adorable. Not really. Stop it. It's a good app workout, Stop it. Though. You're bringing the show to a stop. You're showing up our author guest. <laughs> I'm sorry. Swiveling. I'm sorry. He meant to have a swivel chair. Otherwise, he'd probably I'm not, swivel. I'm not in a swivel chair. I'm, I'm jealous. He's, he's planted. He's planted in place. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was fantastic. And uh, I can't wait to read what's next. Thank you very much. I, thanks for having me. And uh, you can find Wool and Sand and all of Hugh's books wherever books don't have their credentials checked at the door, <laughs> a.k.a. the Internet and often in bookstores. That is it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there's lots. Join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com. Subscribe to our podcast and our video at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, Lem, can you get the lights?